Live from London, this is BBC News. Police use water cannon and are battling protesters on the streets of Jerusalem as compromised talks over Israel's judicial reform bill collapse. Corfu and Evia become the latest islands to issue evacuation orders. Wildfires are causing havoc in Greece. Spain enters a period of political uncertainty after Sunday's snap general election failed to produce a decisive winner. What role could Catalan separatists now play? Hello, I'm Lucy Hawkins. You're watching BBC News. We start in Israel, where talks aimed at finding a compromise over proposed legal reforms that have triggered some of the biggest protests in the country's history have collapsed. Opposition members of parliament said earlier they would boycott a vote on the reforms if compromise talks failed. Now, involved in all of this was Israel's president, Isaac Herzog. He said the country is in a state of national emergency. And we've seen police in Jerusalem deploying water cannon to disperse protesters. They've been blocking roads to the Knesset. There's been a series of votes underway inside the Knesset. President Herzog said the citizens of Israel are thirsting for hope and he called on elected officials to act with courage. But let's take you through exactly what it is that the Israeli government is proposing. Under their plans, the Supreme Court would no longer have the power to overrule government or ministerial decisions, which it deems to be unreasonable. The power of the Supreme Court to review or throw out laws would be weakened, with a simple majority of one in the Knesset able to overrule such decisions. The government would have a decisive say over who becomes a judge, and that includes in the Supreme Court by increasing its representation on the committee which appoints them. And ministers would not be required to obey the advice of their legal advisers, guided by the Attorney General, which they currently have to by law. To add a further complication, we've seen Israel's Prime Minister. He has just been discharged from hospital after undergoing an operation to have a pacemaker fitted. Benjamin Netanyahu says he will be taking part in the vote. We do have the moment that his motorcade drove away from the medical centre. He had been taken there early on Sunday to have the pacemaker fitted to rectify heart issues, but says he is doing well. Let's take you straight to Jerusalem. Outside the Knesset is the BBC's Paul Adams. Paul, what has been happening today inside the Knesset? Paul, thank you so much, and we'll be back to you in Jerusalem throughout the day. Now to some heartbreaking news for the BBC and the wider world of broadcast journalism. George Alagaya, one of our most highly respected and much loved presenters, has died. He was 67 years old and had been battling bowel cancer since 2014. George won many awards and a hugely successful career. It took him from Southern Africa to many other parts of the world. But for those of us that worked with him here at the BBC and also elsewhere, what we will remember most about him is that he was thoroughly decent unfailingly kind-hearted and he was always so so generous such a generous colleague let's look back at george alagaya's life with david Silito. three two one go take at six o'clock the ground war on iraq george alagaya the six o'clock news good evening and welcome to the bbc's news at six and the george you saw each evening that warm authority was the george we knew off screen at six o'clock, the ground war on Iraq has begun. Gentle, kind, but blessed with the intelligence and empathy that made him a wonderful friend and a brilliant foreign correspondent. He joined the BBC in 1989 and was soon reporting from the world's troubled spots. How long and at what human cost can these camps be sustained? War, hunger, genocide. I haven't the heart to count and it doesn't really matter. He saw the worst, but there was always an understanding and compassion rooted in his origins. There is hunger here, but there's also peace. This report in particular had a special resonance. It was his birthplace, Colombo. Sri Lanka, an assignment with added poignancy because this is where I was born. Women that you see. And Africa was where he'd grown up when his family moved to a newly independent Ghana. That house, number 10, Second Avenue, Every morning we'd get into a car, into my dad's Mercedes, and off we'd go to school. And then came university in Durham, where he met his wife, Frances. Many years later, she was one of the inspirations for telling the story of mixed-race relationships in Britain. 
This is our story, but it's also the history of our country. It wasn't that they wanted to live separately, they didn't... Really His ability to convey warmth and authority made him a natural TV presenter. Ten seconds. And so, in 2003, a new job. This, the slightly nerve-jangling moment before his first six o'clock news. Good evening and welcome to the six o'clock news. First tonight, the build-up in the Gulf. The mayor of London, Boris Johnson. Over the next 10 years, he became part of daily life for millions. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six from Downing Street. Now, if you want to get an idea of just how bad this flooding can get, take a look behind me. Right through the night, by the way, we've had aftershocks. You can feel the ground rumble beneath you. And then, 11 years on, there was bad news that he later discussed in this interview with Nick Roberts. Good to see you. It was back in 2014, and I noticed there was some blood in my stool, in my poo. I went to the GP, and he said, look, you're 58, maybe we should just get you checked out. Five operations later, he was back at work. And I just want to say, it's good to be back with you. That's all but the, the shadow of cancer was always there. You know, I wish I hadn't had cancer, obviously, but, but I have cancer. And I'm glad of the things I've learned about myself and about my community, my friends and my family as a result. I have got to places is to see life as a gift and, and rather than kind of worrying about when it's going to end and how it's going to end, I've got to a place where I can see it for the gift it is. George Allagaya. He'd seen more than his share of suffering, but like this program, inspired by the happiness of his family, there was always warmth, that smile, and hope. Britain has emerged as one of the most mixed nations on earth, and I, for one, am proud of that. Let's talk now to broadcaster Alan Little. Alan worked closely with Georgia for many years and joins us. Alan, it's so heartbreaking for us here at the BBC and for so many viewers and people right around the world who knew and, and loved George. I want to talk about his stellar career in a moment, but first the thing that we are all saying about George when we, when we first think of him is what a kind, thoughtful, absolutely lovely man he was. Yeah, uh, he was uh, seemed blissfully unaware of the esteem and affection in which he was held. There was no ego about him at all, and his great strength, of course, was empathy. But I think that what he said there about the experience of having cancer for so many years and being determined to see something positive in it, I think he knew how loved he was because those of us who loved him took the opportunity to tell him so. Uh, and not wait till the last minute. So he had that ability to bestow affection uh, and bestow um, warmth uh, and, and he was surrounded by love. And the other thing that, that David Silito's piece there uh, reminds us of is how rooted he was in the love of his family. He and Francis met when they were in their teens, I think, and, and th she and his two, their two boys were the still and constant center of his life. He was absolutely rooted in the love of his family and it was a very warming and uh, inspiring thing to be included in. Alan, do you think it was that warmth and that empathy that you mentioned as well that was the reason that so many people also wanted to talk to him and share their stories with him? Yeah, it's, I got to know George in, about 30 years ago when we were both stationed in, in Johannesburg together. We shared an office and we travelled throughout sub-Saharan Africa together. At that time, he was already quite an established star in, in BBC News and I was still trying to find my own distinctive broadcasting voice. And so I learned from him. I used to watch him and kind of marvel at the way he engaged with people. He could speak to anybody from heads of state to children in a refugee camp. And, and what was striking is how much people wanted to, to talk to him. And I, I watched him win their trust and what was I think what I learned from him above everything um, was that decent storytelling decent reporting is rooted in values and George had great respect 
for the people who were trusting him with their story, even of, often at the worst possible times of their life, in, uh, uh, in times of heightened grief and heightened loss. And George wanted to do well by all of them. He wanted to be fair. He didn't want to be dramatic. He didn't want to use their misery as colour to, to make his reports more dramatic. He wanted to be true. And I learned from him, I think, that good reporting, decent journalism is rooted in human decency. There was a, a word that he and I used to use when we were living in South Africa, and it's from the Nguni languages of uh, Southern Africa, and the word is Ubuntu. There's no translation into English, but it contains the idea that all human beings are uh, bound together in a shared responsibility for each other. Bishop Tutu used to say, Ubuntu, let me define it like this, I'm, I can only be fully me when you are fully you. We two are connected. I can't be rich if you're poor. I can't be free if you're enslaved. And George mentioned Ubuntu at a, a gathering for, to celebrate his 60th birthday about seven years ago when we thought his cancer had been eradicated and he talked about Ubuntu, the, se the sense of humanity and uh, I think it was his lodestar and I hoped watching him as a younger journalist that some of the values that he lived would, would rub off on me. So he was a very inspiring and, and, uh, and uh, generous and, 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 and selfless man. I don't want to make him sound saintly because he wasn't. He was also great fun uh, and a great raconteur and sometimes a merciless mimic and he was, it was great to sit around a table with him and just laugh. So he wasn't saintly but, he, but his, 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 his sound journalism was rooted in, in values of human decency and I, was, I came to think that in George's reporting there was a kind of outstretched hand, the outstretched hand of a kind of shared humanity, a kind of human solidarity and he st stretched that hand out to almost everybody he reported on. Alan, so many of the pictures we've been seeing, you're right, are of George smiling. Uh, he always had a smile for everyone and you talk about his generosity and I, I wanted to reflect on that personally. He was so generous with his colleagues and with younger people as well, with support and with advice. Yeah, I, 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 saw, I went to see him two weeks ago and that smile, he flashed that smile at me from his hospital bed and, uh, and the thing he said to me, one of the things he said to me that he wanted people to know was, you know, what cancer has taught him is that he had time to reflect on his life, what it meant and to tell to the people he loved the things he wanted them to know and he said to me, Alan, <laughs> if you haven't yet told the people you love that you love them, don't wait. Tell them, if you haven't yet told the people that you want to spend the rest of your life with, that you want to spend the rest of your life with them, tell them, don't wait. And that's kind of what he wanted to say to the world, I suppose, to say to all the people who, who loved and admired him. Alan, thank you for those really lovely reflections on George. We've also had a statement from the BBC's Director General, Tim Davey, who has said that across the BBC, we are all incredibly sad to hear the news about George. We are thinking about his family at this time. George was one of the best and bravest journalists of his generation. He reported fearlessly from across the world, as well as presenting the news flawlessly. He was more than just an outstanding journalist. Audiences could sense his kindness. This is so true. His empathy, his wonderful humanity. He was loved by all and we will miss him enormously. Well, another person who will miss him enormously is Milton Nkosi, who worked closely with George. Milton, you'll remember, was the former BBC Africa Bureau Chief, and Milton joins me now from Johannesburg. Milton, it is good to see you, though, at such a sad time. So many of us, and for our viewers uh, too, this is such a sad moment, even though we knew that George was unwell. I'm sorry for the loss of your friend, Milton, but can you tell us what does spring to mind when you first think of George? Yes, um, <clears throat> it's a sad day indeed, Lucy. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'd like to convey my uh, deepest sympathies to George's family, uh, friends, and indeed colleagues, um, particularly his wife, Fran, who stood by him throughout uh, his uh, cancer uh, challenge, and also his two sons, uh, Adam and Matty, together with their young children, George's grandchildren. Um, we are saddened, uh, my family certainly, and I and many other colleagues, by the news of George's passing. Um, I spend a lot of time with George, uh, as Alan 
mentioned there, we traveled across the continent of Africa. We went to Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Eswatini now, which was Swaziland, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Congo, Kenya, um, all of those countries we travel together. And when you travel together in places that are going through turmoil, it bonds you, you become closer. And we became more than colleagues, we became friends. And in fact, I was very proud when George uh, graciously agreed to be uh, the godfather to my son, who was born in 2001, Hosi Zile. And that brought the families together. George was at my wedding in 1998. We have a picture of him here at home on the display when he was standing at my uh, parents-in-law's house, at my wife's home um, uh, during our wedding. So many, many memories that uh, we shared. We traveled to Iraq together at a time when there was, uh, Lucy, there was a ban uh, uh, flight ban so that you couldn't fly into Iraq under Saddam Hussein's regime. And the only way we could get there to report for the BBC was to fly into Jordan, into Amman, and drive 15 hours across the desert to Baghdad. George and I did those trips together. We spoke about our families, what they mean to us. And of course, we were looking at the prospect that, you know, even we could be in the same fate as the Iraqi people and get injured or worse. So um, as we were reporting, we were actually thinking about uh, what it means to be alive. And, and I'm glad that Alan Little brought that up because that was George. And of course, eventually, we, we also covered the Mandela funeral together. We were at the memorial uh, here in Johannesburg at the FNB Stadium. And then we also traveled to Mandela's final resting place in Kunu in the Eastern Cape. So, so many memories shared. And uh, today, it, it's, it's, it's incredibly sad. But I'm also very proud of the friendships that um, I made and George made and that we we became close um, through our work in, in BBC News. Milton, he was such a passionate advocate for the stories of Africa and, and Alan's reflected too on that extraordinary gift he had for reaching out to people caught up in, in war or a natural disaster. What was it like to watch George working? It was amazing to watch George working because as my brother just reminded me that George was always calm, very thoughtful. And in times of war and rebellion and rioting, when we are um, being shot at uh, with tear gas and rubber bullets, uh, trying to get into the heart of the story, um, George was the uh, calming uh, voice of reason, if you like, because at that point, we all get a little bit uh, passionate about the, the story and we raise our voices and we act like we are panicking and George would be the one who uh, calms us down. So that's really uh, what it was like to watch George. But also, you know, George, <laughs> George was very uh, good looking. We, we all know. He... he he was um, oh I, we just lost milton for a moment but he is back milton do oh. continue we've got you back now yes sorry um I, I was saying that george was incredibly talented to be on screen but he was a fantastic writer as well and that was the one thing that i enjoyed uh, people who watched him on tv didn't really Oh, we seem to be having problems with Milton's line, but just reflecting on the extraordinary talents of George Allagar, not just as a broadcaster, but as a writer as well. Some lovely thoughts and memories there from Milton and Cozy. We will continue to reflect on the remarkable life of our colleague and our friend, George Allagar, who has died at the age of 67. We will continue to remember and also to celebrate his life here on BBC News throughout the day. So I hope you can stay with us uh, throughout the day as we continue to bring you some of those reflections as well. The lovely, much loved George Allagaya, who has died at the age of 67 and everyone's thoughts here at the BBC are with his wife and his two boys at this time.
You are watching BBC News. We're going to turn to Spain now, where the country's Conservative People's Party has claimed victory in Sunday's snap general election, even though it does not have an overall majority in Parliament. Alberto Núñez Rejo said the task fell to him to try to form a government and urged other parties not to stand in his way. The outgoing governing socialists fared better than had been predicted, with the Prime Minister, Pedro Sánchez, claiming voters had emphatically rejected the idea of a regressive right-wing bloc. Here's how the two main protagonists reacted to the election. Let's have a listen. Sergi, thank you so much. Some breaking news to bring you from Sweden. The climate activist Greta Thunberg has been fined after she was found guilty of disobeying a police order. This happened at an anti-oil protest in Malmö last month. The 20-year-old did appear in a Swedish court this morning. She was pleading not guilty to the charge, claiming she was acting out of necessity. Uh, Thunberg will have to pay a fine. It's not yet clear what that figure will be, but will be based on her reported income. So stay with her. This is BBC News, the headlines. Police use water cannon on protesters in Jerusalem as compromised talks over Israel's judicial reform bill collapse. Corfu and Ethiopia become the latest islands to issue evacuation orders as wildfires cause havoc in Greece. And Spain is entering a period of political uncertainty after Sunday's snap general election failed to produce a decisive winner. And George Allagai, one of the BBC's most respected and much-loved journalists, has died. He was 67. Let's return to our top story now. Voting underway by Israel's parliament on a highly contested bill that could see powers taken away from the country's Supreme Court. There were talks aimed at finding a compromise over the proposed legal reforms. They've broken down. Uh, that coming to us from the opposition leader, Yair Lapid. Police using water cannon as well. They're battling protesters on the streets of Jerusalem. One of the leaders of the protest movement and several other demonstrators as well have been arrested near the Knesset, uh, which is where you can see those protests taking place at the moment. Well, with me now is the Israeli historian Yuval Noah Hariri, author of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Yuval, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. What is it Hello. about this bill that you object to? It sounds actually like you're doing well, Katie, particularly putting on that brave face for the kids. Well done. Thank you both so much for joining us and sharing your experiences. Hope you stay well and OK. Thank you. Around the world and across the UK, this is BBC News. BBC News, bringing you different stories from across the UK. For more stories from across the UK, head to the BBC News website. You're live with BBC News. The UN mission in Korea says it started a conversation with Pyongyang over the American soldier Travis King, who ran across the demilitarized zone from South Korea earlier this month. But in a news conference, the spokesperson said they did not have any details of Private King's whereabouts nor what condition he might be in. He ran into North Korea after running away from a flight which was due to take him back to the US, where he faced military disciplinary action. Here's what the UN was able to tell journalists in Seoul. Lots to look forward to still at this World Cup. Nikki, thank you so much. And just to remind you still, Brazil are 2-0 up against Panama. We're keeping a close eye on that game still. Do stay with us here on BBC News. from London, this is BBC News. 
One of the BBC's most respected journalists, George Alagaya, has died of bowel cancer at the age of 67. Police use water cannon on protesters in Jerusalem as compromise talks over Israel's judicial reform bill collapse. More than 80 wildfires burn across Greece as evacuations from resort islands continue. And there's political deadlock in Spain after Sunday's snap general election failed to produce a decisive winner. Hello, I'm Lucy Hawkins. Welcome to BBC News Now. Three hours of fast-moving news, interviews and reaction. We start with some heartbreaking news for the BBC and the wider world of broadcast journalism. George Alagaya, one of our most highly respected and much-loved presenters, has died. He was 67 years old and had been battling bowel cancer since 2014. George won many awards and a hugely successful career. It took him from Southern Africa to many other parts of the world. But for those of us that worked with him here at the BBC and elsewhere, we remember him most as a thoroughly decent, unfailingly kind-hearted and generous colleague. Our special correspondent, Alan Little, looks back at his life. Three, two, one, go take. At six o'clock, the grand war on Iraq has begun. Millions knew him as the face of the six o'clock news. Good evening and welcome to the six o'clock news. And for his calm, unflappable authority. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six. He was born in Sri Lanka in 1955 to Christian Tamil parents. As a child, the family moved to Ghana. This is the road. And he was swept up in the early optimism of a young nation newly independent of British colonial rule. We knew that Africa was going to be united and that Ghana and our, this country was going to be at the centre of it. I mean, I think that was a kind of dream. At 11, he was a migrant again, this time to England, where his parents enrolled him in a Portsmouth boarding school. Here, though there was some racism, he learned to adapt to a new culture and to thrive. Born in Sri Lanka, at Durham University, he met his wife, Frances. Anything like that. I think when we got married, we were aware of a sort of meeting of cultures. You can see that in the wedding photos. We've got two sons, Adam and Matthew. In a turbulent and often dangerous working life, she and their two boys were the still and unwavering centre of his existence, his solid ground. And welcome to the Rainbow Nation. For just over a year now, South Africa has been my base as the BBC's Africa correspondent. I knew George as a foreign correspondent. We worked together in Africa, the continent whose fate ran through his life like a thread through cloth. Right, so this is your, this is where your house, eh? Oh, it's nice, it's nice. I thought of him as a kind of mentor. I was inspired by his example. He was brave, calm and kind. Okay, you get the water from here and, and do that. I admired his gift for reaching into the hearts of those caught up in war or natural disaster, winning their trust even at the worst moments of their lives. In a refugee camp in eastern Zaire, hundreds were dying every day of preventable illness. I asked her what she wanted from life, a job, she said, so I can look after little Petty. In Somalia, he met a woman whose ten-year-old daughter had just died. His own children were about the same age. It seemed wrong to be there at what should have been a moment of private grief. She said it was all right if it might help to save her other daughter. I haven't the heart to count and it doesn't really matter. There were moments when he crossed the line between merely witnessing and actively intervening in the pain of others. We took those we could manage to the French military hospital. At times like this, it's impossible not to cross the line that divides us, the observers, and those we observe. The Rwandese translator we worked with then, Seth Ngarambe, told us his Tutsi wife had been murdered by Hutu extremists. But he was later accused of complicity in her murder and jailed. George wanted to know the truth, however painful, and went to find him in prison. The nature of their reunion, the power of it, says something profound about the George we knew and his extraordinary talent. Well, looking, well, looking better than I thought. Yes. Hey? Come, Seth, can we go and talk somewhere? It's wonderful. He even charmed men at the heart of Sierra Leone's normally secretive diamond trading business. 
Well, look, this is the we'll, big, this is the biggest you've seen all day. Yeah. The world of the so-called blood diamond. This uh, is something to write home about. No, this is about. $2,000, So you're in the clear. In Ghana, he went back to his old school. Somewhere in here is me. Go on. Yes. Well done. <laughs> he would later say that he was destined to spend his adult life in Africa, dispelling the dream he had nurtured so carefully as a child. He was in Johannesburg in the Mandela years, a time of bright promise. Mandela, in his 70s, was about to remarry. And now, sir, the future, you're, you're a man in love? Uh, it is a wonderful moment for me, as anybody else, uh, to be in love. When he returned to the UK, he brought to the studio a wealth of wisdom and experience gathered over years on the road. Though in the seconds before his first six o'clock news, there was some trepidation. At six o'clock, these are tonight's top stories. He was diagnosed with cancer in 2014. After a grueling round of treatment and multiple operations, he couldn't wait to be back in the tumult of the newsroom. He was deeply moved by messages of support and affection sent in by countless viewers he'd never meet. And on his first day back, made this small concession. And I just want to say it's good to be back with you. That's all. Off screen, George was funny, clever, a generous and confiding friend, and full of energetic hope. There was something infectious about his optimism. You always walked away from time with George, feeling better about the human race and the world in general. And that's the BBC's News at Six. The migrant boy, whose family left Sri Lanka with nothing, found his home in a changing Britain, and he took this country to his heart. It's goodbye. The news continues, though, here on BBC One. I watched George for years up close and thought this of him, that people wanted to tell him their story because in his journalism they saw the outstretched hand of a shared humanity and of solidarity. Much loved by so many, George Alagaya who has died and we will continue to reflect on his remarkable life, the wonderful man that he was throughout the day here on BBC News, so I hope you can continue to join us. In Israel, talks aimed at finding a compromise over proposed legal reforms that have triggered some of the biggest protests in the country's history have collapsed. Opposition members of parliament said earlier they'd boycott a vote on the reforms if compromise talks failed. Israel's president, Isaac Herzog, has said the country is in a state of national emergency. We've seen police in Jerusalem deploying water cannon to disperse protesters, blocking roads to the Knesset. There was a series of votes that got underway inside. President Herzog saying the citizens of Israel Israel are thirsting for hope and he called on elected officials to act with courage. Around the world and across the UK, this is BBC News. BBC News, bringing you different stories from across the UK. For more stories from across the UK, head to the BBC News website. You're live with BBC News. More than 80 wildfires are now burning in Greece with tens of thousands of people leaving their homes and their hotels. The Greek government says it's launched the biggest rescue of its kind in response to the emergency. You can see this footage here. It was filmed in Corfu on Sunday. Over 2,000 people have been evacuated from there. And this video was filmed in a Corfu hotel. Uh, guests were dining at the time. The government saying it sent boats to evacuate residents by sea if required. And to Two extraordinary sets of pictures to show you now and it really does il illustrate these two very different types of extreme weather uh, that we've been seeing around the world but, but particularly in Canada. Now this is the Fort Street St. James area of British Columbia that's in western Canada where wildfires have been burning for months. Around 1.2 million hectares of forest have burned in the province so far this year. That's compared to a yearly average of just 76,000 hectares. There are still more than and 30 wildfires burning there. But let's take you to the other side of Canada, to eastern Canada, to Nova Scotia, where torrential rainfall is causing problems there. Three months of rain fell in just one day. That is the biggest deluge in the province for more than 60 years. Flash floods have swept away roads and railway lines, and a search is being carried out for four people who went missing during the storm. Uh, Tim Houston, the provincial leader, described the damage in just one word. He called it unimaginable.
This is BBC News, the headlines. Corfu and Ivia become the latest islands to issue evacuation orders as wildfires cause havoc across Greece. There's political deadlock in Spain after Sunday's snap general election failed to produce a decisive winner. It's been 100 days since the war in Sudan started. Aid agencies say up to 19 million people are facing hunger because of the fighting. And blockbuster film Barbie becomes North America's biggest film of the year on its opening weekend. Let's take you straight to Israel, though, to start this half hour and straight to the Knesset. You can see live pictures there. There is the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, looking well after having a pacemaker fitted over the weekend. That added to what has been a very dramatic time in Israel. On the streets, we've seen police using water cannon. Protesters have been arrested outside the Knesset ahead of this key vote we've seen on reforms. Uh, months and months of turmoil in Israel. Some of the biggest demonstrations we've seen there. And we also see a lot of major firms, including some banks actually, striking in protest because these are reforms that aim to curb the power of the courts, which the government says have grown too wide. What many of the opponents, and I've just been interviewing a few of them as well, what they tell us is that these reforms absolutely oh, imperil Israel that. as a democracy. Uh, so a very divided country right now. This is the scene inside the Knesset, whereas outside, as I mentioned, uh, there are still a lot of people protesting outside too. And rather significantly, there were talks today that were looking looking to find some kind of compromise, uh, they have collapsed as well. And watching all of this for us is Paul Adams, who joins us now from Israel. Paul, firstly, uh, before we talk about the protests and what's been happening on the streets, we were just seeing live pictures from inside the Knesset. What's actually happening there at the moment? Very powerful reporting there from Mercy Juma. Around the world and across the UK, this is BBC News. Now, there are three games today at the Women's World Cup, one of which is still being played right now. But uh, let's take you back to the early cook-off, which saw Italy beat Argentina 1-0. Then we saw Morocco being thrashed by Germany, that match finishing 6-0. And just a few minutes to go, uh, Brazil are facing Panama. Panama is their first tournament in the late kickoff. That game currently stands at 4-0 to Brazil. And there's just a few minutes left to play. But let's talk to sports journalists. Alina Ruprecht, who is here to give us some post-match analysis over Germany's decisive win over Morocco. It absolutely was decisive. A very uh, good performance from Germany. They'll be happy, won't they, Alina? And let's take you live back to the Knesset. We are keeping across all the developments there in Israel because we are seeing outside on the streets a water cannon being used against protesters who are outside Israel's parliament ahead of these votes on reforms which are causing uproar. This is a vote uh, about uh, the judiciary, the reforms aiming to curb the powers of the courts, which the government says has grown too wide. Opponents, though, really believe this will threaten democracy. So this is what's happening right now inside the Knesset will bring you developments throughout the day here on BBC News. Live from London, this is BBC News. George Alagaya, one of the BBC's most respected journalists, has died of bowel cancer at the age of 67. Israel's parliament approves a key part of a judicial reform plan that has divided the nation, with opposition parties boycotting the vote. Outside the Knesset, protests turn angry. Police have used water cannon. 
and this is the scene right now live in Jerusalem outside. You can see there the demonstrations are continuing. More than 80 wildfires burn across Greece as evacuations from resort islands continue. Hello, I'm Lucy Hawkins. Welcome to BBC News Now. Three hours of fast-moving news, interviews and reaction. We start with some heartbreaking news for the BBC. The highly respected journalist and our much-loved colleague, George Alagaya, has died. He was 67 and was diagnosed with bowel cancer nine years ago. George won many awards and a hugely successful career, which took him from Southern Africa to many other parts of the world. But for many who worked with him here at the BBC and also elsewhere, he will be remembered as a thoroughly decent, unfailingly kind-hearted and generous colleague. Today, the BBC's Director General, Tim Davey, paid tribute to George's kindness, empathy and his wonderful humanity. Our special correspondent, Alan Little, now looks back at his life. Milton and Cozy there, and with me is our media correspondent David Salito. David, we have a live page that's up and running on the BBC News website. It's remarkable the wonderful tributes that are coming in for George, and they all just reflect him in such a lovely way. And, and one that I just am reading right now is from our colleague Mick Bryant, who used to work at the BBC. He's now in Australia. And he said something which I think is so true. It is rare in our industry for someone to be so universally loved. That's exactly it. I looked, at, exactly that. It. I looked at that from Nick. And um, occasionally I'm asked by people, they say, what's that person really <laughs> like? And you have to answer, um, <laughs> well, and with George, it really was what you saw on screen. The warmth, the sincerity, the decency, the compassion so gentle, um, very serious as well about his job. Um, and everyone's saying the same thing. They all met the same person. Um, what really interested me was the number of people as well who said, well, he took some time with me. Mm. He um, gave me some advice. He gave me some help. He was quietly kind behind the scenes as well. Um, and people would not be feeling this way across BBC News today. And much further as well, if it wasn't entirely true. Um, and I often think to myself, you know, what's, why do journalists get stories sometimes? And they get stories because, I mean, he was in the 90s going to places where he really was seeing the worst of the world, the, the worst tragedies and dreadful things he saw. And he was having to get people to speak to him. Um, and people react to an energy about somebody. They very quickly work out whether or not you're sincere, whether you're decent, whether you're a person to be trusted with a story. Whether they want to share their whether story Whether they want to you. share with you. And people know it within seconds. They can, they can meet you, can they look you in the eye and see you. And he was one of those persons, you looked him in the eye and he went, yeah, I trust you. I totally trust you. He, he came with that. And also, you know, he had a background um, that was different. Um, you know, born in Sri Lanka, his primary school days in Ghana, the newly independent Ghana. He, he brought a different sensibility to his reporting based on having a different background. And the fact that he was such an advocate for Africa and for the stories that he was passionate about. You know, he gave them, he gave them importance. He, he raised the profile of some of those stories. We cared because he cared. Absolutely. If you... It was really interesting watching him returning to Ghana um, because, I mean, he went in as a child, 1961, newly independent Ghana. Um, and that feeling of the early days of independence and the hope and of the seeing of the pleasures and the joy, so much of the Africa reporting is, uh, has been over the years, what next tragedy do we report from? But he was coming from a, a sensibility of, well, this is a place of joy and hope and people living their lives and people doing well. Um, and because he lived it and knew it. Um, and I think that made a huge difference. And I think one of the interesting things about some of the reactions today was the number of people who were, were growing up and saying, hang on a sec, mm -hmm. there's someone who looks like me. Yeah reading the news there's someone like me reporting people you know the number of households where they go hang on george is on the news and people would come and they would look and they would say yeah, well there's a there's a different face there i mean uh, he says he was the 
you know, the, the first person of colour who was a BBC foreign correspondent. Um, and it's, I, was, I sort of thought back and I thought, gosh, he, yes, it's, 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 you know, it's living memory, you know, it's, you know, it's only back in uh, the late 80s. Um, and he brought it with it, a, you know, that background, that approach to the world, and that, that decency. There will be uh, not a dry house upstairs. I'm a dry eye in the house upstairs, I mean, in the newsroom. I mean, I think we're all overwhelmed by reading some of the tributes and remembering him. And please do go onto the website and look at what people are saying. David, thank you so much. It really is absolutely lovely. Uh, David and I were just reflecting as well. He, he was so kind to us. He shared uh, his support. He shared his kindness. He was a, a lovely, lovely man. And uh, do log on and just take a look at some of the things that people are saying as we remember and reflect on the life of George Allagai. Around the world and across the UK, this is BBC News. Let's look at some of the other stories making news across the UK. The Housing Secretary Michael Gove has announced his intention to relax planning rules in England to build more homes in towns and cities. The plans aim to address the country's housing crisis by allowing more home extensions and conversions of shops into houses. The government has insisted it will meet its manifesto commitment to build a million new homes by 2024. The radical Islamist preacher Anjum Chowdhury has appeared in court charge with directing and being a member of the banned group al Mohajirun, which the prosecution said is known in North America as the Islamic Thinkers Society. Chowdhury has also been charged with addressing meetings to encourage support for the banned organisation. And police have charged a man with the murder of a woman found dead in a churchyard in Lincolnshire. Colette Law, who was 26, was found in a tent in the grounds of St Mary and St Nicholas Church in Spalding last week. Paul Nielsen, who's 30 and of no fixed address, is due before magistrates. You're live with BBC News. The Israeli parliament has approved a key part of the judicial reforms proposed by the government. They were voted through after the collapse of compromise talks brokered by President Herzog. Opposition parties boycotted the vote. The proposals have triggered some of the largest protests in Israeli history. Police using water cannon, uh, they're battling protesters on the streets of Jerusalem. Now the reforms aim to curb the powers of the courts, which Israel's government says have grown too wide. If they're passed, the Supreme Court would no longer have the power to overrule government or ministerial decisions, which it deems to be unreasonable. The power of the Supreme Court to review or throw out laws would be weakened with a simple majority in the Knesset of one able to overturn decisions. Now the government would have a decisive say over who becomes a judge, including in the Supreme Court, by increasing its representation on the committee which appoints them. And ministers would no longer be required to obey the advice of their legal advisers, guided by the Attorney General. There's temperatures that ease a little bit. Well that's good to hear Tomas, thanks for joining us, do stay with us. A double box office blockbuster, Barbie and Oppenheimer take the cinemas by storm, providing the big screen with its biggest footfall in four years. And bye bye Bluebird, Twitter becomes X. But will the new logo revive the fortunes of Elon Musk's social media giant? Hello, welcome along. This is World Business Report. I'm Ben Thompson and we're going to start with the two movies that have got the world's attention at the box office this weekend. Barbie and Oppenheimer delivered the strongest opening weekend at the box office this year as fans rushed to experience the Barbenheimer phenomenon. Following a marketing blitz from the toy maker Mattel and Warner Brothers, the Barbie film was always expected to do pretty well. Globally, it's now estimated to have made $337 million in its opening weekend alone. In North America, Barbie made $155 million. That makes it the fourth highest grossing film debut ever in the North American market. It's only behind two installments of the Avengers franchise and a Star Wars film. 
Well, Oppenheimer, it also delivered. It made $174 million worldwide. That was much higher than it was expected to rake in. Uh, well, let's speak now to Orlando Parfit, who's a senior online editor at Screen International Magazine. Orlando, good to have you with us. So I've run through the figures there. Put it into context for us. How big a weekend was it? Uh, let's run you through some of the other stories uh, this hour. And Russian drones have attacked Ukrainian ports on the river Danube, destroying grain storage infrastructure. Uh, the Danube is a key export route for Kyiv since Russia pulled out of a deal, allowing Ukraine to ship wheat, corn and other products via the Black Sea. Officials say more than 60,000 tonnes of grain have been destroyed in the past week. Ryanair, which is Europe's biggest airline, has reported profits after tax of 663 million euros. That's $737 million for the three months to the end of June. It is higher than before the pandemic. It is evidence that consumers are still willing to spend on travel, even if household budgets are squeezed. Ryanair did cut its forecast for passenger growth for the rest of the year. And Adidas has received orders worth around $565 million for 4 million pairs of unsold Yeezy shoes. Adidas expected to make a large loss on it after ending a partnership with Ye when the rapper made a series of anti-Semitic comments. You're up to date. We'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. Brazil had a comfortable win in their opening match at the Women's World Cup, beating debutants Panama 4-0. Way to go. That's all your sport for now, Lucy. Let's uh, take you now to Sudan, because Monday marks 100 days since the war in Sudan started. 20 years on from Darfur's genocide, it's that same regime that is seeing the most casualties. Human rights groups have called it an ethnic cleansing by Arab militias, backed by the paramilitary rapid support forces. The RSF, as it's known, has been fighting the Sudanese army in Khartoum in a power grab since the middle of April. Mercy Juma travelled to the border of Darfur and Chad. She spoke exclusively to mothers who had fled the violence to try and save their children. But a warning, their testimony is disturbing. So lots of developments to bring you uh, from Israel throughout the day. Do stay with us. Matthew will be here next and uh, will be live in Jerusalem as well to just pick over what has happened there and the significance of this day for Israel and for the next. Hello. The mixed bag continues after what was a 